Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hi there. Good morning. It's Wednesday, July 19th. Hi, thanks for joining us. Uh, yes, we've had a warm morning again, but looking forward to cooler temperatures. Maybe not cooler, but just a degree or so by the end of the week. And we'll talk to Sarah mm -hmm. and Stephen for a traffic update coming up. But first this morning, people in Pleasanton seem to be feeling more shocked than shaken after two earthquakes overnight. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the strongest earthquake registered at a magnitude 3.9. Katrina Weber has been talking to people in the Pleasanton area all morning and say most are just waking up to the news. For most people in this area, this wasn't exactly an earth-shaking event. They say they actually slept through both quakes. Now, the USGS recorded the first after 11.30 last night, a magnitude 3.9. The second, they say, was a magnitude 3.2 and hit just before one this morning. These weren't the only earthquakes in the city this week. The USGS also recorded a minor one Monday afternoon, measuring at 2.1. It also went unnoticed by people here. Now, none of them so far has fallen into the category where damage usually occurs. Police and the sheriff's office say they didn't actually receive any calls about damage overnight. It seems there's just a bit of shock and awe. Didn't really feel anything. We were busy, you know, doing our job, but um, yeah, we don't really get that around here. A closer to the quake's epicenter, which was a few miles down the road, it was a bit of a different story for people there. And we'll hear from one of them coming up today on KSAT 12 News at noon. Reporting from Pleasanton, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Yeah, thank you so much, Katrina. I want to talk a little bit more about that earthquake, specifically the 3.9 magnitude earthquake that occurred at 1122 last night with a depth of 2.6 miles. That occurred right on the Atascosa and Wilson County line, close to the community of Black Hill. Now, that's where this was felt the greatest, and Katrina is going to have more information about that coming up at noon. But what I've done here is I've put on where maybe you might have felt a light shake. It could be near Pleasanton or near Floresville, right along 97 there. But beyond that, it would have been too weak to really be perceptible. Uh, and again, following that 3.9 magnitude earthquake, there was another one, a weaker one, 3.0 quake uh, at about uh, 1247, close to where that epicenter was. So again, it, it would probably have been very imperceptible, if not completely imperceptible around San Antonio. Now looking at clouds and temperatures, we've got some cloud cover out there early this morning, but generally skies are clearing. It's already 82 in San Antonio, 77 at Bernie Stage Airfield, 80 in Hondo, 80 in Canyon Lake, and we're forecasting a high temperature today for the third day in a row of 104 degrees in San Antonio. It's going to be hot all across the metro area, highs ranging anywhere from 101 to 105. It'll be 105 in Pleasanton and Floresville, 103 in Sabinal, 104 in Gonzales, and 104 in Seguin. Now coming up, I'm going to tell you when Saharan dust will be back and may start to be denser. We're also going to talk about a very slight chance for rain over the weekend. For now, though, let's go ahead and get a check of traffic with Stephen Cavazos. Thank you very much, Sarah. Let's get a look around town because things have dwindled down for the most part. But as we have the cameras on rotation, 410 at Austin Highway still shows somewhat of a busy commute, but not too bad at 281 at Jones Maltzberger. I uh, really got through morning rush without spotting any problems, but there was at least one issue that was slow and folks down and it was right here at I-10 eastbound at Loop 410, not too far from Crossroads. A crash was actually reported and there were some big backups that were taking place along those lanes of 410 and I-10. Now our map is still reflecting somewhat of a slowdown there. A little bit of orange and yellow is showing some minor congestion, but be on the lookout. Uh, first responders may still be out there clearing this scene up, so just give them plenty of room and let's hope everyone else is doing okay. So we got through our early morning show without any major issues. The big topic of the morning had been a lot of the construction that we've been seeing. Some of it was taking place overnight and some of it will ramp up a little bit later tonight. Let's talk about what's happening here along I-10 over on the east side of Bear County. There is paving work and my assumption is a lot of these crews out there are probably trying to beat the heat, but this work does start around 8 in the evening and should wrap at 6 in the morning. This takes us all the way to the weekend, Saturday, July 22nd. We'll see a single eastbound main lane closure from Greytown Road to File Road. But for all your traffic knows and don'ts, grass scan this QR code it takes you directly to our KSAT traffic page. I have a full list of closures on our website. Always good to know what to expect, so plan that commute ahead of time. Guys. Thank you, Stephen. The fallout continues after allegations of inhumane treatment along the Texas-Mexico border. 
A state trooper claims that officers were ordered to push migrant children back into the Rio Grande and even deny migrants water in the extreme heat. ABC's M. Wen tells us more about the accusations, accusations rather, and what state leaders are saying. This morning, ABC News has obtained emails sent from a Texas state trooper to his superior describing, quote, inhumane policies on the border, saying troopers were told to deny migrants water and were even told to push children back into the river. The trooper saying we decided this was not the correct thing to do with the very real potential of exhausted people drowning. It's hard for me to imagine a Texas a law enforcement member uh, thinking that those things were OK, but if it was true, and if it did happen, then heads need to roll. That's inhumane. In response, the Texas Department of Public Safety issued a statement saying the troopers are the ones who perform rescues while trying to stop migrants from placing themselves in harm's way. The trooper also raised concern about the risk posed by newly installed razor wire, providing pictures of serious injuries suffered by migrants and describing a pregnant woman who got stuck in the wire and experienced a miscarriage. Texas Governor Greg Abbott's office responding, saying Texas is deploying every tool and strategy to deter and repel illegal crossings between ports of entry. Critics question if that strategy is going too far. We know here from this email that we have a medic within the Department of Public Safety that had a crisis of conscience that said we are treating these people in, in, a, in a horrible, inhumane way. Meanwhile, the latest data from Homeland Security shows a 30 percent decrease in migrant encounters at the southern border compared to this time last year. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. In your morning headlines, we are free to use the a famous taco phrase and a deadly car crash into a house that will make your jaw drop. Plus, a bridge worker survives a 150-foot fall into a river, and a man and his dog survive being lost at sea for months. David Sears is here with all of your morning headlines. Good morning, David. Didn't know you could put patents on phrases, but apparently you can, and mm. now one's been lifted, so let's get to that right away. Let's all say it together. Taco, Taco Tuesday. Tuesday. As of today, we're all free to use that phrase anytime, anywhere. Here's how it all works out. Taco John's is a regional taco joint, mostly in the upper Midwest, none in Texas, actually had the trademark for the phrase Taco Tuesday. Had it for like 30 years until Taco Bell challenged the use of that phrase by filing a petition with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. They wanted the trademark held by Taco John's canceled because they said it was a commonly used phrase and should be freely available to all who make, sell, eat, and celebrate tacos. Taco John's decided to give up the trademark rather than fight a costly legal battle. Instead, the CEO of Taco John's has decided to donate some of the money the company saved on legal fees to a nonprofit that helps restaurant workers with children who need some financial help with health issues. So maybe people will think about donating to a nonprofit on Taco Tuesday. Hey, a quick warning about this video. Watch right up here. Look at it. You see that? car flying right into that house right here. We're going to show you it again a couple times in slow motion, going airborne and then crashing into two houses. This happened in South St. Louis County in Missouri. The female driver was killed. She was speeding, veered off the road, hit an embankment, and then went flying and flipping. That crashed right into those two houses. There were several people, including a child in the house that sustained most of the damage. The child nearly hit. Derek Winsel's girlfriend was one of those in the house. Well, I was in the living room and I heard an explosion and I came out and saw debris had flown on both neighbors' yard over there and the car was in the driveway up on its fend front fender. Yeah, that was a neighbor across the street who saw it after it happened and look what the damage did to the car and the house. The good news is no one in either home was injured. Once again, the driver killed. You are not looking at debris falling from Ambassador Bridge in Detroit. Nope, that's not debris. That is a worker falling 150 feet into the Detroit River. These two folks actually saw it happen to ran to a little shipping supply company. And you can see three guys jump on a boat and they head to the water below the bridge. Now the boat captain said there were a lot of folks who saw the guy fall, so they were pointing the spot where he hit the water. They were able to get to Spencer, who is from Ontario, Canada. The boat docked. The Detroit Fire Department was there to transport him to the hospital. Life saved. I'm very grateful for those people that were there that day and seen me and were able to rescue me so fast and send that boat to the proper location to pull me out of the water. Or if, and if those people weren't there, 
I probably never get to see my four month old daughter again or my beautiful fiance. And just the thought of that kills me. Yeah, Spencer said he didn't actually remember the fall right after it happened. 150 feet again. Just glad to be back with his fiance and baby girl. And finally, this is Timothy Shattuck and his dog, Bella. They were on a little sailing trip from Mexico across the Pacific to French Polynesia. Unfortunately, didn't make it. Timothy and Bella were a couple of weeks into the excursion. They got hit by a storm. Electronics knocked out, couldn't cook any food. So the two of them had to survive off a of raw fish. Health was, was pretty bad for a while. I was pretty hungry and, um, and I, I didn't think I'd make it through the, the storm. After several months lost at sea, they were found a helicopter from a fishing boat was off looking for tuna when they spotted Timothy and Bella 1200 miles from land. The crew of the fishing boat took care of the two. Here's another twist. Bella is not Shattuck's dog. She just started following around Mexico. He tried to find her a home before he took off on his little excursion. Couldn't so he took her with him oh, wow. since Timothy was headed back to his home in Australia. One of the crew members for the fishing boat fell in love with Bella and took her home with him. So there you go. Well, how about that? All ends, all's well that ends well. Yeah. Aww. And that, as they say, is the rest of the story. The rest of the story. There yeah. you go. Good stuff. I was reading that uh, to keep from getting bored, which would be obvious after yeah. months at sea, they would collect rainwater, uh, catch fish, and then he said every once in a while he would take a little swim in the ocean. Okay. A little right. one. Yeah, yeah, just a quick tip. Just a quick tip. Yeah. So, and it reminds you of Castaway. Oh, a lot. Definitely. So That's his look. And yeah. Sun bleached beard and everything. Uh -huh. And Wilson, except Wilson obviously wasn't Aww. real. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, <laughs> at least he had Bella. So yeah. Bella for Wilson. Yeah. So, yeah. But Bella, go. Bella helped out. Bella helped out. Yeah. There you go. So glad they made it. <laughs> yeah. 909, 81 degrees coming up on GMSA at 9. Driving around Texas and San Antonio, you might notice more companies installing solar panels. Max Masti spoke with a local solar company about the reasons behind this increase and the rapid expansion of the local small business. It is not exactly breaking news that it's hot here in Texas, but with the heat and the sunshine it usually comes with, there are opportunities for creating energy. And a lot of businesses around the state taking advantage of this opportunity. Max Massey joins us live, introducing us to Big Sun Solar. This is a local company growing fast. Good morning, Max. Good morning, guys. It is growing, it is growing fast. And yeah, Mark, to your point, I'm learning firsthand, it's very hot outside. No, but we're really just talking about the power of the sun. And it might seem complicated, a lot of people, they're enamored by solar energy, but it, it, it's kind of simple, right? The sun, the power of the sun, it hits these solar panels. The solar panels can take up to 20% of the sun's power. Then it goes through an inverter and it converts the power right to electricity for the companies. And here's the crazy part. These companies, companies across the state of Texas, they can turn the sun's power up to 100% of paying for their CPS bill. So we're here, we're talking about Big Sun Solar, a small local business that has been expanding rapidly, not only here in San Antonio, but really across the state. I wanna highlight one of the big projects that they just signed on to. It is a helicopter manufacturing facility. So take a look. Now, this is their newest project, Saffron Helicopter Engines USA. They're building a solar canopy system at the facility in Grand Prairie, and it really is meant to offset the manufacturing company's energy costs. And this is what's cool to me as an employee here at KSAT. They're going to provide covered parking for all the employees. So I talked to the co-founder and the CEO of Big Sun Solar. He tells me on top of helping save for energy costs, this canopy, it creates an environment that is 40% cooler. So like today, if it hits 100 degrees, under that canopy that we saw yesterday, 60 degrees. It was actually nice to be outside. So Robert Miggins, the CEO and co-founder, tells me more and more businesses, they're across the state, they are calling Big Sun Solar, looking for ways not only to meet some sustainability goals, but also looking at ways to take advantage of tax credits or just offset exposure to the high electricity costs. Solar has gotten cheaper and cheaper over the last decade, but particularly over the last five years. Uh, in addition to that, the newly passed Inflation Reduction Act has really um, accelerated some of those incentives for businesses to adopt sustainability projects, and in our particular case, solar. So the tax credits are more generous, which allows a business which, you know, to see a faster payback and see a better return on investment. 
and Robert being very transparent about the federal government's tax credits, adding that solar and wind and other sustainable sources of electricity, they're increasingly important on how the ERCOT grid is going to meet its energy needs. So solar playing a really important role in how ERCOT meets its needs, especially as we evolve in the grid. And like we've been saying, this really is Big Sun Solar. It's a small local business talking about bringing in more jobs here locally in San Antonio and across the state of Texas. Right now, they only have 15 employees, but they said it is a great topic for especially people trying to figure out what the next career move is, look into sustainability. And obviously, guys, we're going to have much more on the story on Big Sun Solar and the expansion of solar power and sustainable, renewable energy across the state of Texas coming up on the News at Noon and KSAT.com. But for now, I'm going to soak in some sun outside. Guys, back to you. Thanks, Max. You know, he has a good point there about ERCOT uh, really relying on renewables to meet the demand. It helps, es doesn't it? Especially on days and weeks like this where it's all sunshine across the state of Texas and triple digit temperatures. Well, here's the good news for Max. He's going to find some AC pretty quick because he's actually up on the roof Yeah. here at KSAT Studios. Yeah, come on down, Max, and cool off. And yeah. I love the way that Mark Austin says roof. The roof. The roof. The oh, roof. that's awesome. The roof is on fire. No. <laughs> well, roof. Roof. I, I say Fernando, roof. Fernando, how would you say it? I say roof. 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 I say roof. roof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk about another type of fire, the weather. The weather is on fire out yes. there. Uh, but in the pollen count today, not too bad. Molds oh, are low at 360. There's the silver lining, Stephanie. I know you love to find a silver lining Yay. in the forecast. Thank you. It's that molds are low, but you ready? We're going to talk about Saharan dust. Saharan dust is going to be increasing early next week. But outside right now, there's only light concentrations of Saharan dust. It really won't impact your allergies until potentially next week. We are expecting a denser cloud of Saharan dust to move across the Atlantic and by about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, that's when you'll notice it on the horizon. And perhaps if you are very sensitive to the dust, see some allergy like symptoms. But this isn't until next week. Again, this is a week from today at 4 p.m. Some Saharan dust is possible. So we'll just continue to keep you updated on that. For now, though, no, we're going to be dealing with the heat today. It's already 82 degrees, mostly sunny outside. Skies have cleared uh, and we've got south winds at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. Looking outside uh, in Del Rio, it's 84. Good morning in Crescent Springs, it's 82 degrees. 79 in Kerrville, 82 in New Braunfels, and 82 in San Antonio. A little bit closer to the metro area, some slightly more cloud cover out toward Floresville, Gonzalez, and Seguin. 80 in Hondo, 79 in Bandera, and 79 in Kerrville. Here's your KSAT 12-hour forecast. You guessed it, nothing but sunshine today. 92 degrees at noon. So if you've got a couple of hours here to get uh, some extra yard work done, perhaps before it gets unbearably hot. And then in the afternoon, we'll be in the triple digits starting right around three o'clock. Looking at a forecast high today of 104 in the afternoon. Unlike yesterday, the record for the high today is 106. So I don't think we'll make it to a record, but it is still going to be hot regardless. I mean, what's the difference between 104 and 106? And then later tonight, I mean, look at that still 97 by 9 p.m. this evening. Looking at forecast high in neighborhoods around South Central Texas, 108 in Del Rio, 102 in Canyon Lake, 104 in Gonzales, 104 in Pleasanton, and 102 in Kerrville. A little bit closer to the metro area, it's going to be 104 New Braunfels and Seguin, 103 in Hondo, 104 in Divine, 103 in Las Maples, 102 in Kerrville. Good news is, is in the afternoon, humidity will dro drop down. So during the peak heat of the day, when we reach 104, it's not going to feel any hotter than that because humidity will stay lower. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather setup across the nation. And you can see across the state of Texas, it's very dry. It's going to be very hot. That heat high, which was a little bit further to the west in the last couple of days, has moved right over Texas, keeping out any rain and putting the entire state uh, in a toasty position. And unfortunately, I've even had to drop rain chances from the 20% on Sunday to 10% on Sunday because it really only looks like there's going to be maybe one or two isolated showers or storms out there for all of South Central Texas Saturday, Sunday and Monday. So your chance for rain is only 10%. 
Yeah, not the best news, I know, but at least there's a small chance for some folks out there to see a little bit of rain. And then looking ahead, we'll challenge a record on Friday. A little bit more cloud cover Saturday, Sunday, and into early next week, but temperatures are likely good to stay above 100 degrees regardless. Coming up, we're going to talk a little bit about the aquifer. The aquifer at its lowest levels since 2014, guys. Oof. I know. And we're going to talk about the, the uh, health of ERCOT, of our power grid, coming up in the next half hour. All right. Well, we look forward to that. At least for that small chance here coming yeah, 10%. up. 10%. Mm, yeah. I know. It is what it is. Thank you, Sarah. Time now, 921, 82 degrees. And we're now able to break down the number of people affected by Alzheimer's in a specific county. This is a big deal because it can determine how resources are allocated to certain areas. When we come back, Courtney Friedman explains where Bear County ranks among other parts of the state and how people affected by the disease can get help here. When it comes to the highest prevalence of Alzheimer's across the state, Bear County comes in seventh. This new information comes from the Alzheimer's Association in the first report that lists numbers by county instead of by state. Courtney Friedman explains why that's crucial when it comes to allocating resources. My mother-in-law was extremely organized, military wife. She started to kind of repeat herself. She couldn't, you know, figure out who some people were. Byron Cordes is a caregiver for his mother-in-law who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's seven years ago. He's also a managing social worker with Sage Care Management and on the board of the Alzheimer's Association. It's super important to, to know as early as possible. That's why new data just released by the Alzheimer's Association is crucial. For the first time ever, the disease prevalence numbers are broken down by county instead of state. For Bear County, 13% of those over the age of 65 are currently living with dementia or with Alzheimer's disease. That equates to about 33,000 people. Landing Bear County with the seventh largest prevalence in the state. It just highlights the need for better diagnostic tools, better training for law enforcement officials, for physicians, for those that might interact with somebody that hasn't been diagnosed. Greg Schuto is the executive director of the Alzheimer's Association of San Antonio and South Texas. He says these numbers should bring more care and education to high prevalence communities like ours. It highlights that sense of urgency for folks to act and to, to get diagnosis. There is help out there, and I think if they just look and ask. So if you or someone you love is having memory loss that is affecting day-to-day -day activities, it might be time to see a doctor just to ask about dementia. If you want more information about diagnosis, treatments, and even caregiving, go to ALZ.org. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Hey, tomorrow's our KSAT Community Phone Bank to help raise money for Project MEN. It's the oldest, largest licensed nonprofit that accepts and repurposes medical equipment. We'll be accepting donations over the phone to buy more wheelchairs, which is the most requested and needed piece of medical equipment. The phone bank will be from noon to 2 and then again from 5 to 10.30 p.m. And this all leads up to the organization's annual citywide donation drive this weekend. You can drop off any type of medical equipment at the Wonderland of the Americas. This is Saturday from 9 to 1 p.m. And for more information, you can check it out on ksatcommunity.com. Right now we're at 927, 82 degrees. There's a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. Including how federal authorities are cracking down on scam calls. They have a new plan to go after the people who provide phone numbers to the scammers. Plus what former President Donald Trump is saying about the letter sent to him hinting at another possible indictment in the next few days. Welcome back, just about 931. Former President Donald Trump lashing out at the letter he received from special counsel Jack Smith, indicating an arrest and indictment are possibly coming in the next few days. This is the clearest sign yet that the special counsel will seek charges for Trump's alleged efforts to illegally cling to power after he lost the 2020 presidential election. And as ABC's M. Wynn reports, so far it appears Trump is the only one who received such a letter. This morning, Donald Trump now facing his third and most serious allegation as special counsel Jack Smith appears set to indict the former president as part of the wide-ranging investigation into the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Trump announcing on Truth Social he received a target letter from investigators late Sunday, which he says almost always means an arrest and indictment. Trump in Iowa saying he's becoming an expert in subpoenas. I have no choice because we have to. A source says the target letter mentions three 
three federal statutes. Conspiracy to commit offense or to defraud the United States, deprivation of rights under color of law, and tampering with a witness, victim, or informant. Trump says he was given until Thursday to testify before the grand jury, but sources close to the former president say he's unlikely to accept. Trump on Fox News claiming without evidence that investigators are in a rush because of the upcoming election. Now it bothers me. It's election interference. Never been done like this in the history of our country, and it's a disgrace. What's happening to our country? Smith is also looking into efforts by Trump and his allies to cling to power in key states where he lost, talking to local election officials in Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, Nevada, and in Georgia, where Trump was recorded pressuring the Secretary of State to, quote, find the votes he needed to win. So what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. The Michigan Attorney General charged 16 people on Tuesday, accusing them of acting as fake electors, submitting false certifications after the 2020 election, claiming Trump had won the state. The district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, is also leading an investigation into Trump's alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election results in that state. A decision in that case is expected next month. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. Looking out there with live cam, 82 degrees. It's kind of funny the way our, our shift works when we come in. I mean, it's not cold, but the sun's not out. So, you know, right. it's fairly tolerable. And then yesterday, Stephen and I were leaving at the same time and we were like two vampires. <laughs> Just <laughs> going out to leave for oh, work. No. The sun, not the sun. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good way to describe yeah. it, right? The sun is oppressively hot, but at least we're finding a way to stay cool, including little Remy here. Take a look at Remy. Thanks for sending in this picture on our KSAC Connect feature on our weather app. He's got it made, man. First of all, that pool's in the shade. He's got his favorite little chew toy there. Way to go, Remy. I need to find a pool to cool down. It is way too hot outside. By the way, pollen count molds are low. They're present in low amounts at 360, up a little bit from uh, yesterday. But the biggest thing I wanted to talk about right now is our aquifer. So the aquifer is down to 628.6 feet above sea level. This is the first time the aquifer has dropped below 630 feet since September of 2014. In nine years, the lowest mountain. It's been in nine years and it's really only dipped below 630 a few times in history and only a couple of times since the Edwards Aquifer Authority uh, has been uh, issued. So again, very low aquifer levels. Unfortunately, though, I've actually had to trim back rain chances a little bit in the forecast over the weekend. So coming up, we're going to talk about how the oppressive heat continues and quick, you can guess. How many days have we seen triple digit weather in a row? 100 degree days in a row. I'll have that answer coming up in a bit. Thank you, Sarah. Top stories is life in prison for a convicted felon for his role in the shooting that killed four year old Dor Orvion Whitley here in San Antonio back in 2017. A group of suspects are accused in that shooting, but yesterday our camera was the only one there as one man learned his punishment. Terrell Chase was given life sentence for possession of a firearm. The judge actually enhanced his punishment because Chase was a habitual offender. This case was a part of the deadly drive-by that took place six years ago today. More than 60 shots were fired at the home. Dorovion Whitley was in with his brother and mother. His mother spoke with us after sentencing. I sometimes ask God, why should I forgive him? Or how can I forgive a person who took my child's knife? I never get an answer. Only response I get is forgive. Now Chase is still facing that murder charge, but the district attorney's office isn't saying how that will be handled. The other two co-defendants charged in Durovillon's murder are John Chapman and Quentin Phillips. Both men are scheduled to be in court on September 15th. In your morning headlines, the Biden administration is suspending funding for the Wuhan Institute of Virology. A month-long review determined the research institute was not compliant with federal safety regulations. The Department of Health and Human Services is also not including the Wuhan Institute from doing business with the federal government going forward. The facility plays a central role in the theories that the COVID-19 pandemic may have originated from a lab leak there in late 2019, but investigators have yet to reach a definitive conclusion of where the coronavirus originated. 
The Federal Trade Commission announced a new effort called Operation Stop Scam Calls to crack down on illegal telemarketing. The new plan is going after people who provide phone numbers to those scam callers. Authorities say these middlemen have sold more than 700 million phone numbers, often lying and saying the phone owner consented to receiving telemarketing calls. This move involves more than 180 actions that are being supported by attorneys general in all 50 states. The latest economic data shows people are spending more money despite ongoing inflation worries. Shopping at U.S. retailers was up in June for the third straight month. The Commerce Department reported that retail spending rose two-tenths of a percent last month, and that's still slightly lower than what economists had been expecting. They had predicted an increase of half a percent. August is going to be here before we know it, and that means it's almost football time. That's right, and we are so excited for our second annual Case at Pigskin Classic, and this year it's even bigger than last year. Literally, that's right. Just two days of high school football instead of just one. You can see the teams taking part in the Case at Pigskin Classic behind us, but here are the matchups for you. Okay, so it all begins Friday, August 25th, with Antonian taking on Holy Cross at 7 p.m., then our triple header on Saturday, August 26th. It's going to start with Southside versus Somerset at 1130 a.m., then Jefferson versus Uvalde at 3.30 p.m., and O'Connor versus Brandeis at 7.30 p.m. That will wrap up the day. It's going to be a good time, and all the games will be taking place at the Alamo Dome here in San Antonio. You can get your tickets right now on KSAT.com, or if you're a KSAT insider, and we hope you are, you can purchase the VIP experience for the best seat in the house. It's a good turnout last year. Can't wait. I know. Time now, 938 and 83 degrees for now. You're watching GMSA at 9. If you're hoping to get a break from the heat by traveling this summer, you might not have much luck at all. Seems like we're not the only ones dealing with record-breaking heat around the world. We'll explain when we come back. First, as we head to break, here's a look at some of the activities going on at public libraries around the city. From 4 to 5 this afternoon, the Duseum is coming to the Bazan Library. Now, there will be all kinds of fun STEM activities for the kids to do, but you need a ticket for the event. So then over to the Forest Hills Library, Rangers of the San Antonio Mishes National Historical Park will be visiting with the kiddos there to talk about predators and prey in our area. For a look at all the events scheduled for today at different public libraries around our city, just head over to the KSET Kids section of our website at KSET.com. Well, like Sarah and Mike have been telling us, much of the southern U.S. under heat advisories or warnings today. And as CNN's Amy Kiley reports, if you're thinking of traveling to escape the heat, that probably will not help. It's so hot in parts of the U.S. this week, Nevada's tackling extra road repairs. When it's over 100 degrees, our street temps can be over 140. It makes the asphalt soft and big heavy trucks can cause ruts in it. This Phoenix doctor says his ER is trying to keep up with heat-related illnesses. We'd probably use about five or six times that. Uh, unfortunately, we're starting to run out of ice. And this news camera overheated in Death Valley. In fairness, it's the literal hottest place on earth, although some might say that about their own backyards today. It's pretty unbearable um, unless you're in AC or near water. So I was like, we're going to the water. Plenty of Americans are escaping their hometowns for summer vacation, but that doesn't mean they can escape the heat. Italy, France, China, and Japan have new temperature records from this week. Wildfires are burning on multiple continents, and Delta says a flight in Las Vegas didn't even make it off the tarmac Monday because at least one passenger was treated for heat-related discomfort. Health experts just suggest going someplace cool. The most common mistake people make is trying to tough it out. I'm Amy Kiley reporting. As we always say, it's uh, always a great day to go to the zoo. Right now, space is at a premium in the shade again out there at the zoo in the flamingo exhibit. I know that I like they've it. got a baby flamingo somewhere. Oh, they do. I don't. I bet the mama's keeping it close. Probably. But I've yeah, seen maybe. pictures on their social media site about the baby flamingo. I looked up a fact because I knew we were going to be seeing them again. Uh -huh. So I don't know if we talked about it already. So I knew that they can sleep standing on one leg. Right. I mean, we all see them do that. But I didn't know why. Why? They do that. So apparently they can do this because that research suggests that they actually use more muscle power when they stand on two legs. Oh, so, so it's <laughs> easy. Yeah, so Are it's easier. Kinda, 
it's their lazy way to get through the day by standing on one. On one leg, I yeah. I can say with full confidence that I use more muscle power to stand on one leg. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, me too. Me too, as a human. And then they also do this to help stay warm. Okay. Hmm. They, use they won't their... need help with that right now. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. It they want to stay cool. Birds of a feather. So hot. Hey, stick together. Birds of a feather stick together. We have seen today we'll make 12 consecutive 100 degree days. In okay, San my guess was going to be 14, but I'm glad it's only 12. We're going to get to 14, though. Oh. I'm sorry. Hey, take a look at this. In fact, you know, we are now in the top five of consecutive 100 degree days in San Antonio's record. And records date back to 1885. So this is pretty impressive. So, including today, we will be at 12 100 degree days. The last time we did 12 or more was just last year, uh, 14. And then in 2019, we had 12 100 degree days. Here is the thing that I'm going to be watching very carefully. We are forecasting at least five to seven more 100 degree days consecutively. That would put us up in third or second place. And it's not out of the realm of possibility that we could get to 21 consecutive degree days or more. We'll have to wait and see, but this is the forecast over the next several days. Again, we'll be kind of close to 100 on Sunday and Monday, so we'll have to wait and see if we can beat that streak. Okay, so 104 today, 103 Thursday, and just shaving off a few degrees into the weekend. Either way, you slice it, it's going to be hot, and we could even potentially get a record on Friday with that high of 102. Looking at the weather setup across the nation, you can see there's a bit of rain across the plains and then nearer to the Mississippi River out there. But around Texas, it's completely dry because this heat high is in place. High pressure system works to create sinking air. It prevents rising air, which eventually rising air results in showers and storms. So with the sinking air overhead, we are dry as a bone and we are hot too because it's compressing the air above us. 104 in San Antonio, you can see all across the state of Texas, temperatures are going to be close to, if not in the triple digits. And so ERCOT, uh, you know, the grid conditions are okay. You can see that the supply, forecast supply, is expected to meet the demand over the next several days, but it's going to get kind of close tomorrow and uh, we'll be keeping an eye on things for you. One thing that's for certain is all of our solar and and wind is helping to meet this demand for energy during the hottest part of the year so far for us. And that heat high again is going to stay uh, the main weather factor for us. It is going to move a little bit off to the west in the coming days. So that's why temperatures are going to be shaved off a couple of degrees, but it's still going to be hot. Again, 103 tomorrow, 102 on Friday. We'll be close to 100 degrees over the weekend, but look at what happens on Friday. A good portion of the state we'll be able to see some rain with that heat high moving overhead. As for us, our rain chances are very low. We're talking 10% over the weekend and into next early next week. So do not bank on the rain. There will, however, just be the hope for a, a isolated shower or storm. Chance for rain is only about 10%. 82 degrees outside right now. It generally, it's in the 80s already. 80 in Yavaldi, 81 in Rock Springs, 81 in Kerrville, 82 in New Braunfels, 84 in Del Rio. And in your KSAT 12-hour forecast, 92 by noon. We'll be looking at 104 for the high temperature today. We're going to stay shy of a record, but still hot. It'll be 97 by 9 p.m. 101 in the Lotus, 103 in Honda, 102 Bandera and Kerrville, 105 in Pleasanton, 104 in Seguin and New Braunfels. And humidity is going to come down in the afternoon, so we won't have to worry about a heat index value. Dew points will be in the 50s, which is a, technically a dry heat, even though it is heat nonetheless. Temperatures anywhere from 101 to 100. 105 over the coming days, and again, a small 10% chance for an isolated shower Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I like that that takes place over a couple of days because even if we don't get rain, maybe a small chance of cloud cover. Yeah, it will be partly cloudy over the weekend, so that's better than what we're dealing with now. I think so. Silver lining Steph, that's what all I right, call her. All right, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> 949, 83 degrees. And we talked about Barbie yesterday, but now we're talking about the other big movie hitting theaters this weekend, Oppenheimer. When we come back, a preview of the film and what the stars of the movie are saying about it. The heat seems to be all anyone can talk about that these days. That's why tomorrow on GMS 8 9 we'll be speaking with a health expert about the serious health risks associated with scorching temperatures and high humidity. 
So tune in for that live Q&A tomorrow on GMSA at 9, plus much more. Christopher Nolan has made some big movies over the years, from Inception to Interstellar and the Dark Knight trilogy. But for his latest film, he tackled one of the biggest stories of all time. CNN's David Daniel got to speak with Nolan and the stars of Oppenheimer before the Hollywood strike began last week. We're in a race against the Nazis. And I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. Killian Murphy plays the father of the atomic bomb in Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. This is a matter of life and death. I can perform this miracle. World War II would be over. Our boys would come home. We're trying to not judge the man. We're trying to experience things with him and understand the man. And I felt that Killian, who's one of the great actors of his generation of all time, he has that unique empathetic ability to draw the audience into the, the truth of the situation. Nolan sought Murphy for the title role after casting him as a supporting character in five previous films. I was so exhilarated to be given the opportunity. You know, it's a kind of a dream part, but, but it's so multifaceted and massive. His co-stars also felt the scope of the story and the film. A huge amount of humility was required from this whole cast to kind of come in and say this is a really delicate and important story and we want to uh, service it correctly. It confronts you with things that are so much bigger than you on, on a human level and on the, a physical world level in what we live in. And yet it, uh, it's an emotional movie because of because Chris really and Killian really pulled off that initial thing that he said it's you it's it, you do come through Oppenheimer's heart. eyes. I don't know if we can be trusted with such a weapon. But we have no choice. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Will Barbenheimer save the box office? Industry observers forecast Barbie could be the first film to debut with $100 million or more since Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse in early June, while Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer rather, with higher IMAX ticket prices to help make up for its R rating and three-hour runtime could be looking at about a $50 million opening weekend. Interesting, and with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 expected to bring in $25 million or more, this could be the biggest box office weekend in a while. Did you get your tickets for Barbie yet? No, I, I need to, but I know I won't be able to see it like opening days, right. but you know, maybe sometime soon after that, but I better look now. And you got your tickets for Oppenheimer. For Oppenheimer for tomorrow. Tomorrow. I see it Saturday, but I couldn't find it on IMAX. It was sold out. Yeah. Oh, wow. I got it a couple months ago. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And Barbie on Monday. I'm seeing Barbie on Monday. There you okay, go. I think that might be our best bet as well. All right. <laughs> well, have a good day and have fun at the movies.